Hi, sorry about that. Um, my name's Hannah and I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. And um, my PhD uh, has been focused on adapting this methodology called spherical Slepian functions. And its work has been carried out with Kathy and Kieran and with some help from Elaine Plattner at the University of Alabama. So this talk is actually a really good follow on from John, John's talk. Um, hopefully you'll agree at the end of it. So before I speak about the specifics of my research, I wanted to provide a quick recap of how we produce secular variation models from satellite magnetic data. So we've now got a 20 year data set of, um, of satellites flying around the earth. And we've got the CHAMP, the cryosat and the swarm satellites, which have all been treated using this geomagnetic virtual observatory concept. So this concept developed by, um, well, really kind of the last 20 year data set has been put together mostly by DTU, um, takes any satellite data that's flown through an equally spaced column and kind of averages it to a singular point in the center of that column. So you can see that in here. So we then take that observed data and we can say that our observed data is related to our model of secular variation. Um, multiplied by a matrix which contains the spherical harmonics of that location and its phi and theta derivatives. So we've got this 20 year data set now, which um, I've just shown the swarm kind of SV model ticking through here. And this is a really, uh, this is just, um, yeah, we can do more Penrose inversions to get from measured data back to our SV model. Sorry. Um, so now we've got these global models. Why do we want to investigate regional variations in core surface SV? So different dynamics are known to operate across the core. So we know that outside the tangent cylinder, so this area above and below the inner core, we have these roles of like Taylor column fluid uh, kind of moving up and down the core. We want to know whether the dynamics inside the tangent cylinder are different from the dynamics outside and whether we can see that in our measured measurements. Um, we also want to know how things at the base of the mantle, such as the LLVPs that John was just talking about, affect flow in the core. And we also want to, by understanding these individual regions and these individual dynamics, hopefully we will better understand uh, the global secular variation and maybe improve magnetic field forecasting. So if we use our spherical harmonics, um, if we create global fields, we generate a lot of ringing. Um, so we produce large amounts of unwanted signal. And this really contaminates the area that we're interested in studying. And it causes a lot of problems for us. So we have to look for an alternative methodology if we want to investigate different regional features. So, one way of investigating potential fields is to use spherical Slepian functions. So these functions basically take a input uh, potential field in spherical harmonics, and it then splits it into inside and outside of a region. The benefit of doing this is it allows us, it completely minimize, well, it doesn't completely, it minimizes the amount of ringing and we can also have relatively complex region shapes. So we're not limited to um, circles or um, very, we can use whatever outline we want to because we generate these by considering the geometry of the region. Also, there are a very compact way of studying uh, the field. So if we look at the gravity map, um, you need um, 5,027 spherical harmonic coefficients to describe the global um, gravity map. But if you want to study just the area inside that circle, you need 4,181 significant spherical harmonic um, coefficients to describe just that region inside the circle. Meanwhile, you need 41 Slepian coefficients to get it to the same level of accuracy. Um, so we don't need very many functions in order to describe the same field. Um, these functions are constructed by maximizing the function within the specified region um, where it is orthogonal to both the region and the complementary part of the sphere. If we take our data, um, well, if we take a look at that initial um, equation I showed you, um, 
we can multiply by the G matrix and the transpose of the G matrix and end up exactly back where we started. So we can transfer, transform things into the Slepian basis, do our separation, and then transform it back into the spherical harmonic basis. The other thing we do is we um, order our functions by contribution to the region. So in this case, um, our first eigenfunction has 97% of its energy concentrated inside this black region. By the time you get to the fourth eigenfunction, it's only 89% of its energy. And we generally use a 50% energy cutoff to describe the whether it's contributing to the region or not. So we're taking the, the first few functions in this matrix and applying it into our inversion. Um, so this is one of the novel things I've been working on has been how do we incorporate these Slepian functions into an inversion and with damping, um, which is essential for kind of producing these SV models. So the results I am going to show you are focused around these LLVPs. So John kind of provide a nice introduction to these. Um, so these are features of low seismic velocity at the base of the mantle. And they've been linked to a whole host of um, different observations. So um, hotspots, large igneous provinces, um, we've got some, the, and then what exactly these things are and how they're affecting core flow is really poorly understood. So we want to know what are the, how are these features relating to core flow? If these have, uh, if these are very hot features, then, and there's very low heat flow, then you'd expect there to be less forcing applied to the um, core flow underneath. So there would be potentially less um, core flow. Um, there's a lot of things that we could discuss about these, but it, for the sake of time, I'm gonna just try and show you some of my results. So what we've done, first of all, is we've taken our secular variation for, um, for our five years of um, swarm data, and we split it into inside and outside the patch. And um, we've got a bit of overlap in our region just to ensure that it's um, going all the way around the world. Um, and hopefully you agree with me in this, when I say that we've done a pretty good job of recreating these main features that are present in the region that we're interested in. So um, yeah, we're just looping around to the beginning again. And we can see that we're actually kind of seeing a bit more detail because we're trying to separate it. We're trying to isolate the features that are only due to that region itself. So um, this is quite interesting for me. I don't know if it's interesting to other people. So the other thing we can do, instead of looking at it spatially, we can look at it spectrally. So if this is our five years of um, swarm data that's uh, plotted as set for variation at the Earth's surface, we can start to see that inside these patches, we've got quite a large spread at these kind of um, antipodal um, spherical harmonics. And that does suggest that these features could be uh, affecting the flow on the time scale because we don't see these in the outside region. Um, the other thing is these spectra are flattened because of the complexity of the region and the fact that we're considering these things um, orthogonal uh, to the sphere. So you're changing your functions so that they're no longer just, just orthogonal on the sphere. You're kind of adding a complexity that it pushes the description into some higher spherical harmonic degrees. So there is um, a lot of things to be looked at here. Um, we're just kind of beginning to look at how exactly we can best describe these impacts on uh, uh, from, from this into kind of more meaningful interpretations about what this actually means for the flow. Um, if we then continue the downward continuation all the way to the core surface, we're starting to see some of the problems that we're identifying with this technique. So actually here we have um, much larger kind of signal measured uh, inside the region than we do at the surface, uh, at the, if we use just the spherical harmonics. And 
this is quite interesting uh, because we've applied the same damping for all of these models, but this suggests that we're going to have to apply some kind of regularization to account for the fact that we're um, looking at a restricted region as opposed to a full global model. And we can also see that there is quite a lot of variation within these um, plots. Um, so hopefully, when we look at the full 20 year data set, we're going to be trying to identify things like this westward drift of these flux patches and um, trying to identify whether these uh, can correspond to changes in the flow. But how these affect the um, we can't really draw any serious conclusions about this until we solve the problem with this kind of regularization. Um, so if we then look at the spectra, we can see that even though the, um, the spatial maps are changing, we see very little variation in the spectra. And that's uh, quite interesting because why would there be so much variation at the Earth's surface, but not at the core? mantle boundary. Um, maybe this is to do with the regularization. And also we can see that using just the outside functions um, follows our chaos model quite well. So maybe, maybe this flow is much lower, but again, we need to kind of look a bit more into this. So um, we have actually converted some of these SV models into core flow models, um, but there's not really enough time in this talk to discuss kind of the impact of that. But the main thing we're trying to do right now is to kind of really nail why we're having issues with this regularization. Um, and we want to take further regions to, of interest to ensure that it's robust, regardless of the degree we're considering and the geometry. Um, Finally, a small personal plug, I am finishing my thesis in less than two months and therefore would quite like a job. Um, if anyone knows of anything going, then that would be great. Please come and talk to me. Um, but yeah, interesting things and hopefully we can tell something about the impact of LLVPs on core surface flows in the near future. Thanks. Thank you very much. Has anyone got any questions for Hannah? Uh, I'll ask a quick question if I can. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so Hannah, um, when you're defining these LLBPs at the at, uh, surface, um, and then you're downward continuing, is that is that the same volume that you're going down, or are you somehow you know upward continuing the shape of the you know? I'm just, just thinking in terms of, you know, sampling kernels and, and things. Um, if you're defining the LBPs at a surface, then uh, isn't that going to be yeah. drawing in, you know, um, uh, so, components of the field from outside? Yeah, um, we are taking the outline of the LLVPs from, um, it's a paper by Dubrovnin, and then we just apply a smoothing factor. Um, yeah. We then kind of, we consider that outline as kind of fixed at, we're upward and downward we're continuing the data. So we're not necessarily, can, that is interesting. I don't think it would make a difference because, because we're considering the outline at the core mantle boundary. Okay. It may not make yeah, a difference. We're not, we're not adding any kind of like buffer to kind of account for the fact that, yeah. Does that make sense? Um, I need to think about that, sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. Thank you. Nice talk.